wonderful. Shucks. That and that. There we go. It's a little better, even though it shows up on my artwork in the back. So. All right. And we are live. Awesome. Here we go. Welcome, everybody, to the inaugural episode of ABT Time. Woohoo! <laughs> party. Party. <laughs> party time. Um, my podcast, which we've kind of been talking about for a long time, and I think really is crystallized by last week's um, Narrative Blitz event. And we've got our first two informal guests here. Uh, Jen Martin and Ewan Belson, who were members exactly, you, do you realize we started the course a year ago yesterday, uh, the very first round, you guys were both in the first round, right? Um, That's right. Um, you know, yes. time flies when you're in a pandemic, hey. <laughs> That's <laughs> what it's been, exactly. Um, so these were two of the 50 guests that we had in the first round, both from Australia, both of whom got up at 4 a.m., every session to be a part of the I felt so guilty I never never invited anybody from Australia to join in the the course and all of a sudden you guys heard about it said would you mind if we do the course and I go it's gonna be 4 a.m and then remember um later we moved it to a later time and Jen you said that was worse because you said that 4 a.m was really good to start your day with with the course yeah right? well you know like the perfect time to immerse myself in the world of the abt and hang out with you randy but yeah because a couple of hours later you know there's kids needing help getting ready for school and making school lunches and 4 a.m it was just divine because you know you wake up the whole house is quiet you sneak into the study you get to hang out with all these cool people and talk about cool stuff i i loved it suited me <laughs> just perfectly uh that's great and you are in melbourne and um you and where are you I'm on the Tablelands, Northern Tablelands of New South Wales on the East Coast. Wow, like how far inland? Mm, so about two hours inland, about uh, 200 kilometres, about 100 and, well, I suppose about 150 miles or so um, inland up in 1,000 metres up here. So, yeah, beginning to get a bit chilly here, but the air is clear, um, very sunshiny. Um, right. Yeah, it's good. Excellent. Um, and, and what kind of work you do there? Oh, so I'm a local land services. I work for government, um, mostly with farmers. Um, a great bunch up here. Um, sheep, cattle, a little bit of cropping. Um, and I work with them to try and sort of, I'm the sort of national parks and wildlife of private land, I suppose. That's what you say I was. Yeah. So I look after all those areas which, um, yeah, parks aren't into. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Works interesting. well. Um, excellent. And then Jen, you, you do science communication at University of Melbourne, right? Um, it, it felt, remind me a bit more on what you, we had a couple of little chats during the course, but what kind of stuff you do? Yeah, so I, I started my life as a field ecologist and spent many years out in the field following animals around trying to understand what they were doing, um, but started to have real misgivings, I guess, late in my PhD about what the point was and how was I ever going to have any impact on the world if all I did was what I was told to do, which was to write academic articles and, and go to academic conferences. So I guess a similar journey in some ways to you, Randy, of going, hang on, there's got to be more than this and, and identifying that the key thing I thought that was missing from our science education was teaching scientists how to communicate properly so I founded my first subject designed my first subject about 10 years ago now and I've spent the last 10 years building a science communication teaching program at the University of Melbourne which is really trying to train our scientists across all disciplines how to be more engaging when they communicate how to be more effective communicators thinking about uh, lots of different audiences thinking about the impact they want to have a lot of our students are research active students so we're teaching them in the context of their own research uh, and, you know, it's just been so useful for me to come across the ABT and work out that this can be a tool to teach our students about narrative because, you know, I'd been doing narrative myself for a long time. I've been doing talking about science on the radio for 15 years now and you develop your own skills about how to tell stories about science. But knowing how to do that and knowing how to teach that, as we all know, are quite different things. So, yeah, coming across the ABT and your books quite a long time ago was just huh. super helpful for me. Now, that, that's really great. Um, one of the things I mentioned in my first book was the uncanny experience of how many times um, over the years I get invited by some faculty member at a university and that person shows up at the airport and picks me up and we're driving to you know, take me to my hotel. And I instantly, and I've never, never met this person before. And then sitting in the car thinking, God, this person's a really good communicator. And it becomes this sort of positive feedback loop, which is the good communicators mm -hmm. 
know this stuff's important. They reach out to me. Invariably, they bring me to their university. And then on the drive to the hotel, they start warning me. All right, tomorrow you're going to give this talk. And there's going to be a bunch of people in the room that hate you and think this is stupid, a waste of time. <laughs> but, you know, for now, and it's the same thing with the two of you. You know, you just instantly are really good communicators, which is all circular. The reason you got interested in the course, because you already understood mm -hmm. this important, valuable. Um, it's really tough because the other bit I add on to that was in all these university visits, invariably, I give the big talk, we'd all go to dinner, a bunch of graduate students and professors, and then somebody at dinner would say, you know, the guy who really should have been in your talk, but never would go to your talk is such and mm. such character. And that's the other side of the, you know, the, the rich get richer and the, the poor get poorer. The poor communicators don't go to this stuff and they just never get any better. And the good ones are, they just keep doing it. And it's slow, it's just, you know, slow progress. But um, that said, I, I want to ask both of you, you know, part of the reason I wanted you to be on this first little session here is, um, What's happened in the year since you did the course? Have you been able to apply it to some stuff? And tell me the, the downstream results of having done the ABT course. Uh, starting with first, the, Ewan. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've probably used it a, a, a little bit. Um, it, it, that's something which I was really interested in from you, Andy, was the application. I think you talk about exercising the muscle. Yeah. Um, and there are so many muscles um, to use to do different jobs. Uh, I think that's that's where it would be really handy to 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 sort of you know across the breadth of applications of where this is useful and the evidence of of, of what it actually does for a living. Um, for me, um, I've used it in in the occasional media release. Um, if I want to put a case forward for funding or of that sort of that sort of thing. It helps sort of distill and clarify something down to its base elements and really keep banging that case away because I find if I'm talking to people and they don't exactly agree, they'll find a way out. And if you obfuscate, which is was a great uh, uh, thing on the YouTube um, thing segment you did, that gives them the opportunity to chase away in these different directions and not keep to the main problem, which I know often is hard. It's going to be a hard thing to face. Um, we need to keep banging away at it. You know, you know that, that's, um, that kind of cues the term, which uh, Diana Padilla has become one of the major uh, kind of instructors in the course now in the last six months. And um, one term that she's honed in on is controlling the narrative. And mm -hmm. you don't want to sound like a manipulator, but that's really at the core of all this stuff. And that's what you're talking about right there, which is you're trying to control yep. the narrative and then they're seeing the obfuscation chance to take it off in a different direction. And it's a battle. I mean, that really effective communication is a battle. You're out there competitively trying to control the narrative and get your information message across. Um, that's really interesting. By the way, um, just for everybody viewing, uh, it's tea time here at least. And <laughs> <laughs> Jen's got her cup of, uh, cup of tea. And this is my um, my friend, Anna Cummins, who will be joining us eventually, and, and not today, but in one of the sessions, gave me a couple years ago, three mugs with the letters ABT. This is the only survivor. Here is the A, which <laughs> died a painful death. And this is all that remains of the B. Um, so I'm down to only the T left. I promise you both were lost in non-alcoholic circumstances. I don't know what they fell off the counter or something. But that said, um, this, since this is the inaugural episode of this podcast, uh, one of the ground rules is that everything that we talk about is going to be ABT centric here. So it's going to be, I will not be telling you about the Dodgers baseball team or what I bought at the grocery store yesterday. <laughs> and if I get off on those things, uh, everybody's encouraged to write obnoxious comments on the Twitter feed, which is, um, uh, hashtag ABT agenda. And uh, I think Matt will be watching that. And anybody watching live right now on YouTube, uh, feel free to, to type in anything you want on hashtag ABT agenda. I'll write that down and hold it up in a bit. But um, we'll have people ask questions as we go along. We're just going to sit here and ramble. And then, Jen, can you give us a few more thoughts in the year since doing the court? Did you do you did both? Did both you guys you were the Platinum Club and you did round two as well? Yep. Yep. You and were you in, in, Yeah, you came back for the second round? I did the first round. I don't think I did the second round. Yeah, no, I did the first round. Okay, I just good. couldn't get up that early. Right, that is incredible, <laughs> 4 a.m. And Jen did. And, um, you know, for anybody listening, what happened, we did the first round, uh, 50 people in it, and it was 10 one-hour sessions, started April 20th last year. Uh, it was, you know, I hate to say this, but it was 
kind of the, one of the best, if not the best group ever. Um, there was something to the energy. Yes, exactly. Something to the energy of everybody being in shock from the pandemic and a lot mm. of people feeling lonely and isolated, needing structure in their life. Suddenly this was a little daily or not yep. daily, you know, a couple of times, three times a week structuring element. And I think we all just jumped in um, wondering what is this thing? How would it work? And by the time we got going, but the other thing that happened, you know, again, I hate to say or anybody in the government agencies, but um, some of the people in government agencies, they, we do a round with them and they're kind of given this course to slot into their busy work day. And so they're taking time off other things at work to do the one hour bailing out the, the open groups, which is what you guys were in. Um, it was everybody paying out of their pocket. So already they had a, a financial reason to show up every time and listen really intently. And then they were so diverse, all different walks of life. Um, you may remember we had a, you know, an acting teacher, we had a book publisher, we had an environmental artist, all sorts of different folks. And the conversations were really vibrant so much so that we got mm. to the end of the hour and Matt would let it go for another 15 minutes and then finally pull the plug. And there would still be, you know, 10 or so people having a vibrant conversation there with the government agencies. They tend to get the end of the hour and it's time to go on to the next meeting or something. They're all book solid. And so there just never is any lingering conversation. But both of those rounds of the course with you guys, there was just all that energy that we got kind of accustomed to. Then as we began running with the government agencies, they have their own wonderful strengths, but it is a little bit different, you know, and, and some of them. I mean, there's a kind of a convergence of a lot of people working on similar problems there that get a value out of the, cor of the course and they can talk among themselves on that. But there wasn't, again, um, there's a different chemistry when we do it open. We did another open round in January. You know, ever since starting the course, it's been going nonstop pretty much. We're in the 13th round right now. In two weeks, we'll start the 14th round. We'll have two going simultaneously. And it's booked all the way through the rest of the year pretty much, you know, everybody wanting in. Uh, which is great. So it's it's really, really fun. But you guys were the pioneers. Uh, and so then, to Jen, the question to you is, in the year since then, how have you gotten use out of it? So I think for me, Randy, obviously, I, I also use it for my own work. But I think the most important thing I can add is, is the value of ABT as a teaching tool. Because, you know, for years, scientists have heard this mantra, you've got to tell a story. And to your average scientist who hasn't ever had any sort of communication training, that's a really difficult ask. You know, what the hell does that mean? Once upon a time, there was a little girl called Jen who liked animals. You know, people find that a really hard thing to, to have said to them. And so for me, for years, I've been playing with different ways of, of different tools, I guess, for our science students of how you tell a story. What does that actually mean? And so the ABT for me, is, basically, I can say, look, narrative theory is this huge field in and of itself. You could spend your lifetime studying it. You don't have time to do that because you've chosen to be a scientist. The, the way you're going to capture your audience's attention, the way you're going to get people to engage with and be invested in and care about your science is to tell them a story rather than give them a whole series of facts and to then have that shared language and say, so let's not fall prey to the AAA. Let's use the ABT. And it makes our students focus in on this problem solution dynamic. And it's just so powerful. I haven't had a single student in the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of students we've now taught the ABT to who don't you know, who hasn't sort of turned around and said, oh, yeah, I get it. This is how I can rush, you know, not get too invested in the background, yeah, not yeah. spend my whole life doing what I would normally do as a scientist and write an introduction that goes on for pages and pages and pages and finally get to my own aims at the end. This is how I can get to the crux of what do we already know? What do we all agree on? But then really quickly get into my butt and identify where's the gap here? Oh What's the problem God. here? And then be clear on, and this is what I'm going to do about it. And I mean, Andy, you would just love it. You would drool. You need to come and listen to our students <laughs> after we've trained them in the ABT and they get up and they can tell us their entire research project in a couple of sentences focused on this is the problem and this is how I'm going to solve it. You know, um, you know, and we now use it in our assessment. You know, yeah. it's, it's really important for my Let, Let's do something program. with that. With, let's do something with Zoom. You know, I, I could find an hour sooner or later let's do a session you you think through what would be really valuable um that'd be great are you tuned into the new book the narrative gym yeah sure am yeah. Oh, good really okay good. yeah that that was the whole purpose was you know this came out of the course and you guys you weren't quite there yet with the three-step model it's, it's emerged from it but this is the thing i'm proudest of is how thin this book is compared to houston yeah. um so yeah. it's much more practical for students and everybody, which is just boil it down to the nuts. It's only 75 pages of, of content. Um, and that's that's wonderful to hear because that's exactly what, let me, let me tell one. And by the way, you know, this is the podcast. So 
part of what's going to be fun with this podcast is that um, I had a lot of guests in the course last year. And as soon as we got the course going, my first instinct was, oh, all these interesting friends I know, I got to get them in this course, had them in. And after a while, people, uh, Mike Strauss in particular, um, and a few others, you know, began to ask, say, that was an interesting guest, but you know, how exactly they relate to what we're trying to teach here. And so some of them were, were interesting, but just not quite there. So now with a podcast, I can have people that just come in and ramble and things that I'm interested in. Doesn't, I don't feel the mandate to make it all relevant to exactly what the ABT agenda is about. But that said, um, it's, it's, I'm also going to tell some, you know, not racy stories, but things that are just a little more, uh, I don't know, pushing the boundaries. But towards that very end, I want to tell one little anecdote um, connecting with exactly what you said there about this thing about you need to tell a story. And you know, Alan Alda is wonderful and he has contributed so much. And I've written about this in the books that when they, I think the most important thing that happened was they named that Alan Alda Center after him at, um, at now Stony Brook University. And that one move, you know, in the simplest little soundbite validated improv for the science world overnight. I had been doing improv stuff with the Groundlings for several years before then. And all these scientists, you know, turned their nose up and ah, this, this thing doesn't seem very serious. Suddenly it was serious once Alan Alda did that, which was wonderful. Um, but it's always a little but in these narratives as we know. <laughs> but There's always got to be a but. A, yeah, exactly. About 10 years ago, I gave a talk in a, an EPA workshop and a woman came up, talked to me after the talk, won't mention what university she's from, but she said last year we hosted Alan Alda and he was so great and the improv stuff and everybody just loved the improv. But the thing he kept saying over and over again is you scientists need to do a better job of telling your stories. And she said, after a couple of days that we all agreed with him. We said, we agree. How do we do a better job of telling our stories? And his answer was basically by telling stories that grab people, you know, by telling stories that get people interested and excited and pull them in. And she said, and we said, we agree. How do we do that part of it? And he didn't have this analytical part, which, you know, mm -hmm. nobody has had. It, it's come out of my 30 year journey, digging deep into Hollywood, discovering this ABT dynamic and then formalizing it into this thing and now propagating it. But it is really important it, to, to get it down to this simple analytical entry point for people. And as you say, the divide between a right and wrong way to do it. And when I gave the TED Med talk in 2013 on it, was the first time a lot of people wrote to me and said, you know, in some ways, what they got more out of that talk was pointing out the and, and, and structure as the wrong way to do it. Um, you know, we'll get around to figuring out the ABT, but no one had ever said there was anything wrong with and, 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 and that's kind of crucial part of the process as well as to, to realize that just pouring out, I mean, and, and the last thing to say on all that is so many people have um, said to me, I already knew the stuff. I just didn't, have a, a name for it, a label in this analytical thing. Same thing, you're, what you just said to me is what Diana Padilla has said in our course. Um, she's a professor at Stony Brook University. We were undergraduates together a long time ago. She's a evolutionary ecologist. And she just said, I already knew all this from 40 years of writing proposals, but never had a way to articulate it like this and especially to teach it, as you say. So that's what's really powerful. Yep the teaching of it. Um, can you think of any specific moments with students of anybody nailing something or any, any singular moments in the past year with the ABT? So, so I guess one of the things that we do a lot of is, you know, teach public speaking and because teaching public speaking when you're teaching fully online is quite different. We can't give our students all the opportunities to get up and speak in front of an audience. One of the things we've started doing is doing 15 minute one on one sessions with each of our students, which, you know, we have a lot of students. So you sit down for 15 minutes on Zoom, you ask the student to talk for two minutes about their research and then you really talk with them or what hook are you using to grab people's attention and how are you structuring your ABT? So we've been workshopping ABT one-on-one -on -one, uh, with, with lots and lots of research students. And often I find that, you know, it, it, your point is that the ABT, it, it's not simple. It sounds simple and it's straightforward, but it can take quite a lot of workshopping to get there. So a student can tell you their ABT and you can be like, mm, no, I don't think that's quite right. You haven't quite nailed, you know, what's the actual problem here? But in the space of 15 or 10 minutes, you can workshop and you can get the student to eventually identify what the key problem is here. The problem is that we don't know this or the problem is we don't know the correlation here or whatever it is. And all of a sudden, once it clicks and you actually have the but statement clearly, 
I just feel like everything changes for that student from that point forward about how they talk about their research because they understand then this is the crux of what I'm trying to do. And that workshopping, you know, it's labour intensive. It's, you know, 15 minutes for each individual student when you've got a couple of hundred students, but it is so powerful, wow. Wow. unreal. That, that, that is awesome. And that's the same thing we've been doing in the course. Um, and the crazy thing in the course is without naming any names, we get individuals who are in the thick of large research projects with huge budgets. Mm. And you say, what is the, what's the problem? And next thing you know, they're like, well, it's kind of, I, they can't articulate what the yeah. problem is. And, and it's hard, right? Like it's not, yeah. you know, it's easy to sit back and say, oh, surely if you've got this big budget, you should know what the problem is. But, but the problems can be multifaceted. It can be, there can be lots of linking problems, you know, to really get to the crux of this is what I'm doing. And we then also make our students say, and why does it matter? You've got to be able to tell me why, does, why should I care about this problem? You know, getting back to basics yeah. is so powerful. Yeah, yeah. Um, you and um, first on this, uh, one of our listeners tweeted a question of um, where have you seen since the court taking the course, where have you seen the ABT in out in the real world, you know, and have you spotted things like, oh, that sounds like ABT or anything like that, that I'm um, hearing good presentations or media or anything? Oh, I must be getting old. Uh, there was a really, uh, it was a fantastic <laughs> thing in in on the ABC the other day, um, and I and I searched back through it, Randy, to try and find whether I could get a recording of it, and um, it was it was it just encapsulated that whole ABT um, ethos, as it were, and um, and I couldn't find it. But um, I do. I think when you do this ABT thing you become that much more aware you've got a sort of your antenna are up and you're thinking this is good you know this is for some reason this has captured my attention and and when i actually look at it and i look back on the conversation i know why because you know each yeah. step back um We've got some great speakers in, in Australia who uh, you know managed to put forward there's a great program the conversation um, on the ABC and there's some great speakers there and um, I think if you just listen to radio programs and particularly radio programs TV is good but radio sort of focuses the attention on the conversation more um, and you listen now um, it's you, know, you can practice this AB, ABT thing yourself but then you can listen to other people and you can listen to examples much in the same way as you go to a conference etc you say why was that person so good why what was it that, and what can I do to kind of lift myself to, to that level? That's all, all good. But I think probably one of the main things within what you're saying here is um, I sometimes, you know, the government work is much like a large ship, which is cruising along. It, it's massive ship just cruising along. But sometimes no one asks why we're doing what we're doing. <laughs> and and much in the same way, Jen, as your students, you get involved in this task-driven world. It's it's little tasks you have to do. No one stops and says, "Well, why are we doing this?" <laughs> you know, it just stop. Well, you know, and everyone says, "Don't stop. You're rocking the boat here." You know, we might have to change direction. And that's well, the question. It takes a bit well, of courage. And, and you know what? Um, <clears throat> connected with that, which I, I mentioned in the books, I, I gave a talk years ago. I think it was at Notre Dame University. And a scientist came up to me afterwards and said, have you ever read the Chaos in the Brickyard essay in science in the early 60s? And I go, what? And now what is that? And that's one of the great things giving talks is all these people basically contribute knowledge to you, things that you didn't know about. And you write it down and you go off. And um, so then I cited it in the Houston book. And <clears throat> it was a simple little one page essay written, I think in 1961 by a scientist. Um, and early on, it, it was really about molecular stuff, you know, in the wake of Watson and Crick, I think describing structured DNA. And the guy tells this little fable, once upon a time, there was a brickyard and there were all these guys making these bricks to build these buildings with. And they got better and better at making the bricks. And eventually they got so consumed with making the perfect brick with all the right angles on the brick that they just started piling up the bricks and forgot what the bricks were for. Um, <laughs> and isn't that what you're talking about there? You know, where you get so much obsessed with the mission, you no longer even know what that, uh, it doesn't matter. These bricks, look at how good they are. You're yeah, just doing. Why? Just doing, exactly. So it's kind of the myopia. And that that's where this stuff, I mean, here's one of the fascinating things. There's so much we've learned in the last year. This has been um, 
for the the narrative blitz that um i hope you guys can tune in on we're going to redo the whole thing on june 9th because it was so popular last week we had 1500 people sign up for it and, and nothing but raves it, it really was a, a home run because it was so abt'd at multiple levels because i <laughs> kind of forced it all into that but it's 20 talks that are structured in an abt structure in the 20 talks and then each talk has got an ABT to open with and has the ABT arc to it, um, all that sort of stuff round and round. Um, but this, uh, and what the hell was I just talking about? I got so wound up about the, uh, the narrative blitz. Um, Jen, tell us something as I remember what I was talking about. Well, I guess my reflection on seeing in seeing the ABT in places was, uh, I don't know if you're both familiar with a, a competition called the Three Minute Thesis Competition that started in Australia, but it is international now. It started with a guy uh, during water restrictions in Australia, standing in his shower and using the three minute timer, knowing that he had to turn the shower off after the three minutes and standing in the shower thinking, it'd be really good if we could get our PhD students to explain their whole thesis in that three minutes. So it's become this really uh, very well-regarded competition competition now the three minute thesis competition and with one of my colleagues Michael we were running a training session earlier this week for students who want to go into the competition this year and we were teaching them about the ABT and Michael and I were saying if we go through a whole lot of examples of winning videos from the past few years I wonder how easy it'll be to find a video that fits in with the ABT structure to use as, as an example and it turned out to be not that hard at all we had this perfect example a guy who won I don't know a year or two ago I think it was an international version of the competition and it was the perfect ABT. Whether he'd ever heard of the ABT, I don't know, but it was basically, I think it was about glaucoma. I can't even remember the details now, but basically, yeah. you know, this is the disease. This is what we know about it, but this is the problem. And so this is what my research is doing about it. We could just pause it and say, so that was the end. Now let's listen for another, you know, 40 seconds. That was his butt. And now we'll listen to the end and that's his therefore. And it was just amazing to come across it so perfectly. Yeah. And actually what I would say back to you is that doesn't amaze me at all. Um, mm -hmm. And that's what I would predict. And I, I would bet you if somebody took the time and looked at all of those presentations over time, it would demonstrate what I've talked about narrative selection, which is that yeah, they, probably. yeah, invariably they will converge on year after year. People will get it, get it, get it. And then pretty soon they're all going to be um, pretty close to ABT structure, not perfect. Yeah. You know, then you'll hit a point where they start to sound too similar and they will be selection for a little bit of variation off of that yeah but, exactly <laughs> but that said one of the things that we're <clears throat> we're clearly sort of observing is um as a matter of fact in fact liz foot who gives one of the presentations in the the um narrative blitz um she was part of a committee at a conference a few years ago they assigned her to write a statement about this um, marine park they were creating she wrote the initial first draft and then <clears throat> a whole bunch of people got involved you know the whole committee dynamic they passed around Everybody rewrote the whole statement, every single word pretty much, but nobody changed the ABT form. Once you lock onto ABT form, how are you gonna push it away from that? The exact same thing happened with one of my film school buddies who's a major editor who edited a major documentary. It's on Netflix right now, it's hugely popular. And it opens with a one screen of text that <clears throat> he wrote it, ABT structure, because we talk so damn much about it. He's got it crammed in his brain. Um, and then he told me, he said, you know, I'm watching these producers come in and the writers and they're rewriting, same thing. They all rewrote mm. the entire ABT. They eventually took out the words and and but, but yeah. it's still the structure was there and it's in the movie. You can look at the opening screen. It's talking about these mobsters. It says they were this, they were this, they were this, they were never this. Um, mm. And that's, that's the ABT and therefore here's the whole movie. So I kind of have that as one of the little properties of the ABT. Once you lock onto it, you're not going to be able to argue to go back to and, and, and reverse it. And then last thing to say about that competition is what Mike Strauss has talked about a lot um, in the USDA and the agricultural world. They have a big meeting, uh, three societies meeting, and they put together one of those lightning talks thing. And I think theirs were two minutes and Mike went to it and a bunch of them were boring. And then the head guy said, yeah, but at least they're over in two minutes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's harsh. Yeah. That's well, harsh. so, you know, the, the, what that means is that just making it shorter doesn't guarantee anything. You, you still, it's got to be ABT. It's got to have that. No. Strength. And I mean, I guess you're right. I probably shouldn't have been surprised because you're right. Probably if I went and studied them, a whole lot of them would conform, would conform to that. But I guess I just never, you know, I've been judging the three minute thesis competition for years, but I've come to the ABT later. And I, I don't know, I, just in my, in my naivety or my innocence, I just hadn't put those two 
two together and gone, oh, yeah, actually, the perfect structure for a three-minute thesis talk would be this. But I think you raise a really interesting point, Randy, and I'd love to know your thoughts on this. Like, if you know, if you manage world domination and everyone understands the value of the ABT structure, you know, what's going to happen if it just becomes so boring that we lose that spark of grabbing our audience's attention because everyone's so tuned into that as a, as, you know, as a formula, you know, as a recipe? What? Is that ever going to happen? That's a good question. No. No, it just won't. Um, because look at sitcoms. There's your demonstration. Yeah. <laughs> That's True. exactly what it is. Now, here's what we've kind of discerned is that um, if if the content starts to become repetitive, then the form shows. That's mm. the basic rule. And so if you're if you're producing a sitcom, and these sitcoms, by the way, are written to precision formula. Uh, Matt, yep. can you give us a two sentence summary of what goes on with the structure of a sitcom? Oh, yeah. Every uh, joke structure for a sitcom is set up, set up, punch, set up, punch. That's how every line is written, like down to a T, like producers yeah. and writers, head writers insist on that every time. Set up, set up, punch, set up, punch. Yeah. And there's there's no rebellion happening in Hollywood. Too. We got to get rid of that structure. No, it's that's the, the, the magic. Now, the problem is if you're you're recycling the same content. And that's what happens, you know. Some sitcoms eventually kind of hit the ground. Well, that's the famous jumping the shark with um, with Happy Days, the famous sitcom in the uh, whenever that was the '80s that eventually ran out of ideas. And when you start to run out of ideas, then the form starts to to show. You start to see through. Mm. There's the scaffolding. Oh my God, here we come. Now we can predict this is coming. Now we can. But if the content's different each time, um, th that just doesn't become a problem. One of the little experiments that I talked about in the Houston book was. I did a workshop with a bunch of business people and 30 of them and I had them all write their ABTs, sit around a circle of 30. And my hypothesis was to test whether or not by the time the person read, you know, person 26 read their ABT, would the whole group be tired of hearing these and, but therefore, and the answer was no. Um, we got to mm -hmm. 26 and every, each one of them was so completely different that the scaffolding, the ABT structure disappears. It's, it's invisible. Um, it's yeah. underappreciated basically because everybody's focusing so much on the content. And to that extent, people end up not even understanding how important the, the form is. But mm. if you get the form right, then the, that just turns invisible. And that's the beauty of it. It allows everybody to really focus on the content rather than trying to rearrange it in their mind. Another one of the great things that's come up in the, the course, I keep mentioning Diana Padilla because she's been a major resource to come in from the hardcore science world where she's been reviewing proposals for years. She spent a year as a program officer with the National Science Foundation. And she's been a part of the course. She listened in on your sessions back then. And then with, by about the third or fourth round, I had her give a, a, a talk. And now she gives a whole presentation on proposals that each iteration keeps getting sharper and sharper and better and better. And she talks about some of these basic things. And that's what she had said was that, you know, she already intuitively knew this stuff from all these years of writing proposals, reviewing them. Mm -hmm. But this now gives a, a means of articulating it. Um, and yet one of the things that she mentioned that's so important in proposal writing is that she talked about, you know, when there's a panel, th these people get together to review, you know, the, the panelists get together and they've got 25 proposals to work through in a weekend. And the first thing they do is read through the summary of the whole thing. And if that summary is hard to read because you've got the narrative pieces in the wrong place, that you just get bogged down and you got to read it again and again. It just starts to drain all the life out of you and you set it aside. Yep. So I'm going to try and come back to this one later. It's just too hard to get through that. And then you hit the next one and you breeze right through it because they've got the structure, right? And that's, yep, exactly. that's the sad part is the same information rearranged. Suddenly your brain has to do the rearranging to make it work narratively. Mm -hmm. And that's the whole goal of it is to have done that work in advance. So all this stuff is already there. It's relatively simple. In some ways it's not that revolutionary, but the byproducts that are no, coming but it's but but it's managing to free up the kind of cognitive effort of your reader, isn't it? As you say, it becomes the structure is invisible because mm -hmm. it's so simple, but it means your reader or your listener is not having to invest any brain power in trying to decipher what what this means, and they can yeah, just be fully fully focused on the content of what you're talking about. So it's this real aid to cognition, I guess. Yeah, well, but then now the working, it, yeah, that's yeah. where the working circles work so well, Randy. Um, you, you know, you, because he, everything got tossed in the air. You, you had a structure that was presented in front of you and, and you just asked questions. You said, but I don't get it. You know what? what it's the last bit that should be up the front and, the you know, you got a bit in there and that needs to be put. 
it's the reassembly. You kind of bust your toy and it was putting it back together again. <laughs> and it was just, it, it, it was great. It works every time. That, that, that's awesome. Um, so as I said, you guys got to find a way to, let's see if we do it at 11 in the morning here, which is what we'll be doing it again. What, that'll be 4 a.m. for you guys again, right? If we do that, the, awesome. sorry, the narr narrative blitz on June 7th, is going to be 11 a.m. Um, will that be 4 a.m. for you? It's already in my calendar, Randy. I've already signed up and paid. It's in my calendar for 4 a.m. I can't wait. <laughs> okay. Um, because I, I guarantee you, it, you'll enjoy it. and It'll be worth your time and energy. Um, and you'll see, uh, uh, that was what I was, was wanting to reference, was that um, all 20 of those talks begin with um, the ABT. So the person says their ABT, and we have it up on the screen there. And not a single person from last week wrote an email and said, I got really tired of hearing 20 ABTs. And no, mm -hmm. it, it, each one provides a roadmap for the four minutes of their presentation. So that you already know where we're headed in this thing. Now we're going to go into the more expanded out version of that, which is really nice. But one of the best talks in there, that this is just, I mean, it's so deep. This is stuff that's happened since you guys did the course is one of my old buddies here, um, a woman named Patricia Limerick, who was a professor of history at Harvard University when I was there as a graduate student. And her name was in the newspapers uh, periodically, the uh, Harvard Gazette. And I remember every time she was in there, her last name Limerick, you know, aut automatically, how could you forget that name? And then <laughs> she was always in the papers dressed up in this, this court jester outfit, like what in the world is going on? And that's all it stuck in my mind, Limerick, goofy history professor. Um, and then in 2000 and about seven or so after my movie Flock of Dodos came out, one day I'm sitting there working away and on my email, this pops up and it's an email from Patricia Limerick. And I look at it and go, there can only be one <laughs> Dr. Limerick in the, the entire universe. And sure enough, it was her. She'd seen Dodos. She really connected with it, yada, yada. Uh, make a long story short, we got to be really good buddies. And I've been out there and done a few things there. She's at the uh, now at the University of Colorado. So she did her PhD at Yale. Um, in 1987, she wrote this book, The Legacy of Conquest, that's one of the most important books in the study of American history. Um, it's really fascinating. She's a fascinating character. She's a MacArthur fellow. She's the co-founder of the Center for the American West um, in, at the University of Colorado and a total character. So she and I um, started talking last year. Well, for, for starters, five years ago, 2016, she had me give a talk to the history department there. And I talked about the ABT and lo and behold, without telling me a month later, she had to give a big keynote address, which she opened by putting her ABT about the progressive era, blah, 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 in the history of the American West. It was up in the screen, 400 people. And then she said she read it off the screen. She looked at the audience and like everybody was riveted. They'd never seen an ABT on the screen before. And then at the reception, she said people came up to her and said, we felt like your talk was over with, <laughs> with by the time you finished that slide. It's like, we got it. You know, you're welcome to keep going if you need to, but we know your message. And then, you know, the, the talk was really enjoyable because we knew the roadmap where you're headed to. So that made a fan of her five years ago. And then mm -hmm. based on that, I said, well, why don't you come tell that story in the course? She told that story, but then she started to get deeper into what you'll hear in the narrative blitz, which was she, one of her little expert side expertise over the years in history is she studied a lot about court jesters back in the medieval era. And the court jester was the one person who was allowed to be an idiot and ask stupid questions of the king um, and not be executed for it in theory. And what she says is democracies ought to have a, 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 that sort of person, you know, a fool. That's the, the key word that she is an official fool who's allowed to ask these, these stupid questions. And the, the more she talked about that, the more it started to dawn on me, wait a second, this is what's going on with working circles that you're talking about, Ewan, is that you get these people in there and they don't know your content at all. So if you if your only criteria was content, you would call them a fool, but they know the ABT principles and they turn out to be in some cases, the most per important person in the working circle because their brain's not all clogged up by knowing your content. And as you're presenting a boring ABT, they're thinking it's cool because they know your field. But instead, you know, they're the one, and this has happened, Jane Monk gives one of the talks in the, the Blitz about exactly this, the food uh, plastic packaging forum that she runs. And she did a working circle and she got a guy in there who was 25 year old business guy from Philadelphia who had a music publishing company, I think, didn't know the first damn thing about plastics, but knew the ABT stuff. 
turned out to be the best guy in the group because he kept stopping them saying, I'm lost here. I, I don't know your content, but this ought to be understandable to me. And mm. that ended up being the most powerful thing was being forced to, yes, find this ABT structure. And so out of that has come this concept now that we use a lot, which is we, we sometimes talk about the science fool. And then Diana Padilla picked up on that and said, in these panels, you need to write your NSF proposal so that the science fools can read it because it's not going to be yeah. reviewed by people writing your discipline. It's going to be handed over. You're working on ecology. It's going to be given to sometimes a geneticist. And yeah. that person's essentially a content fool, but that person has the same instincts for form. So you'd better put it together. Does that make sense, Nat? Um, yeah, it's, it's really, there's so many talks like that in this blitz that, that all integrate together and, and kind of show you where we've gotten in the past year that all started with you guys. And one of the things I say at the beginning is that it's been 10 years of working this ABT thing. The first five years were kind of slow boil as I gave talks and tried to you know test the waters. Is this thing really that interesting? The second five years was the Houston book and story circles, which we began to see, yes, it really is valuable. And then you guys were part of the start of the past year that's been high boil, where we've done this thing every single month, just about. And every one of the sessions is followed by a conference call with um, you know five to 10 of us for 45 minutes or an hour talking about what we just did. And you do the math on how many sessions we've run the last year. That's over a hundred conference calls that are all incubating us. Out of it comes that three-step model and the book yep. and the whole deal. But you guys were there at the start of it all which is amazing <laughs> so you and i think we should claim a whole lot of credit then don't you, I think, you know. <laughs> talk to Absolutely. your lawyer have their touch. we demand co-authorship it, of the book <laughs> if it hadn't been us getting up at 4 a.m and bringing you know bringing the aussie spirit of inquiry who knows what would have happened randy very very true well you guys are, are pretty damn good communicators to start with by the way um do you guys do you know the juice media do you know their videos um oh not, no i don't Tell you us. Don't. And I think they're based in um, in Melbourne, um, Giordano. Oh, how terrible. Oh, my Sorry. God. They're, they're super edgy, hilarious videos about politics in your wonderful country. Um, oh, well, gonna... there's a lot of interesting politics going on in our country at the moment, so I look forward to watching. Oh, they, they are awesome. They are so awesome that I am a donor and supporter of them. And, um, yeah, they're just – they're really, really good. And – you know, talk about ABT. They're very clever. They're like two to three minute videos that are filled yeah. with profanity as only Australians know how to use it <laughs> skillfully. <laughs> and actually, I mean, they resonated with me because, you know, I lived there in the 80s, uh, most of the 80s in Australia. And you guys have this dark, cynical humor <laughs> towards politics <laughs> that, you know, you know how to get beyond the over seriousness of it all and always have the cynicism towards politicians. And there was so much comedy back then on the TV. And I, did, did you, you and did you ever know those calendars that the guy did of all the penises of politicians? <laughs> did you I didn't know? No, I oh. missed it. This is the same thing I missed. Oh, I'll bet that wasn't God. produced in Armadale. No, oh, God, that just sounds, that and... sounds utterly horrific, Randy. Oh, I'm it's thinking hilarious. about our current politicians. <laughs> oh, it was, the, they were the funniest calendars ever. And they were all these, you know, they were all paintings of, <laughs> <laughs> guys just standing there with their equipment um i'm sure it's got to exist somewhere on the internet they were they were priceless there's so much australian humor back there that i absolutely loved and so when i started seeing these juice media videos um it just resonated the exact well same. we got a lot of jesters over here randy so <laughs> yeah um they don't get their heads chopped off <laughs> <laughs> they do a good job yeah, that's it. What, it, it give us a one or two um, sentence summary of what, what the state of politics are right now. What, what's up with climate issues there in Australia? Oh, go well, for it, Ewan. It's pretty dismal. I did see, I read something the other day. I can't name the politician, obviously, but um, it was a picture of this politician leaning back in Parliament, yawning. Um, and uh, it basically, the, the article was really clever because it, it said on the one hand, he'd been talking to the Chinese about wind farms and, and welcoming the Chinese into the country on uh, wind farms um, up around the tablelands and, you know, where the wind blows and um, uh, welcoming all the green credentials that these, these things had. And this was going out. And then the following day flew down to Canberra and um, 
was championing the coal industry and, and how we needed some more coal plants. And it, what he basically said in a clever thing was that the politics was basically to pander to the, to the people and get as many votes, depending on what region of Australia you were in at the time. <laughs> um, and it was, it was just so clever. It was, the picture was there. Uh, off to another day's work. I've got to say this over here and I've got to say this over there here and it'll keep me in power. That's that's what it said. It yeah, keeps me I going. I mean, it's it's just it's just unbelievably depressing because you know we have this right wing federal government that seems absolutely committed to continuing to invest in fossil fuels, even though the rest of the world is. I mean, yeah, we're just falling so far behind. It's absolutely dismal. And given the natural resources we have and where we could be, I uh, yeah, yeah, everyone I know no. is thoroughly uh, beyond ang- angry. Um, what, one extremely cool segment we did in the course that it's a shame we didn't do it way back and think to do it with, with your rounds. Um, about three years ago, there's a show here on HBO called uh, Real Sports with Bryant Gumbel. It's really excellent. Um, you probably heard me rave about it. It's my one of my favorite shows on TV. That, it's pure ABT. It's such good storytelling in the sports world. And it's only one episode per month. Um, and about three years ago, they did an episode about the Great Barrier Reef scuba diving. You know, they reached out and included that as a sport. And the premise of the whole segment, 12 minute segment, was that um, look at this country that is so proud of its Great Barrier Reef and yet is producing all the coal that is changing the climate that's killing their number one tourism resource. Isn't that a bit of a conundrum? And so they went there (laughs) and they interviewed um, one of my old buddies, Charlie Barron, ended up being the main character, which was exactly the right guy to have in there. He did, he was perfect. And so they aired this thing. And I saw it and jumped out of my chair. Oh my God, it's perfect. I, I transcribed it. And then I did the whole ABT analysis on it, did a blog post and just said, look, everybody, you know, here's your case study of how the ABT works. This embodies everything of narrative principles. I, I broke it down to three act structure and, and so many details in there, all the superlatives, blah, 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 and posted out there, rave, rave, rave. Uh, about two weeks later, I get this email out of the blue from the producer of the segment from HBO. And he was on vacation with his wife. Somebody forwarded it to her. They were sitting by the pool and she read this thing and it like made his day and they toasted to it that night. He said, I've never had <laughs> really detailed analysis of my work. That's also full of praise. Uh, make a long story short, we became best buddies. We trade emails all the time. In fact, I just realized I got to send him an email about last night's episode just posted for this month for um, the real sports. But um, in November, we did a special round of the course for coral reef ecologists and I, he sent me a copy of that and we had everybody watch it. Um, I'll send it to you guys. You, you, it's great. You know, it's. Mm. Yeah. I'd love to see it. Yeah. 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 And it's perfect ABT structure. Um, and then I had him come on and do a guest spot with the course and talked about all that sort of stuff. And it was the same thing, you know, just running up against a brick wall with the coal industry. Mm. And, and he, he interviewed a couple of spokespersons there and they just talked, you know, craziness about all the jobs and yada, yada. Um, now that said, believe it or not, we're already, burning up running out of time and joe witty has asked a question he was in the course uh, one or two rounds ago he's asked a question to get me on track of actually doing some work here instead of having fun with you guys <laughs> so um let's see on that note maybe we should sign off with you because i'm going to segue into what the question is he asked and we'll end up reading up the last of the 12 minutes but uh thank you both you were supposed to come on for only five or ten minutes and now we're at <laughs> 50 minutes after so we ate up the whole time we could go for another hour or two this is what's going to happen with this podcast. It's no way it's going to fit into an hour each week, but I, I got about 20 things here to talk about. I haven't even started on them, uh, but thank you both so much. And um, I'll send you a bunch of emails and we'll get you watching the narrative blitz. You'll it, it really, I, I think it was the most important thing I've ever done my whole professional life. It really was the grand synthesis of all of this stuff all in one event. So I'll be interested to hear your take on that. And on that note, thank you guys both so much. Um, and I'm thanks a- so much for inviting us. Can't wait to hear Thank more. Thank you, Randy. You betcha. Yeah, yeah we'll do, to take we'll part. You betcha. All right. Keep in touch. And uh, we will. Your- Happy okay, podcasting. Oh, See thank you. Bye. Okie dokie. And Matt, can you enable me to share the screen? So I'll put a couple of these slides up here and hopefully we'll delight Joe with what I show here. I hope he's still listening because he hit the bullseye with his question. Um, which is, let's see here. Um, okay, I am now the host, which means that I can do this and I can share these and here comes the sharing and we got the this and the that and the share. And now we're gonna do this 
And in our remaining 10 minutes, and I will, you know, I'm not going to be razor sharp at ending at uh, the top of the hour, but pretty close. Um, and so this is what I meant to start this whole thing with, but we got <laughs> bypassed it with the Australian folks. Um, always ABT. This podcast is always going to be related to ABT, hopefully. And if I get off on some bizarre tangent, please feel free to tweet um, at hashtag ABT agenda. I should have put that in here. Um, but a comment about what, what does this have to do with the ABT? So that needs to be the criteria. Always advancing the narrative. Hopefully we keep moving forward with all these topics. Um, to everybody listening, send me emails, uh, rolson at usc.edu um, to of what your problem that you're working on. Send me an ABT. We'll work on those if we can. We'll get a few minutes in for a few ABT analyses. And then guests, I will have guests uh, like that, but then they're not going to be like featured advanced, you know, advertising advanced. They're just going to be just like we did spur of the moment, whatever people come in five or 10 minutes. Park Howell was going to join us. Clearly he got busy with something. He wrote to me that yesterday he did a job with another client and used the ABT and knocked it out of the park. And he just keeps having those experiences one after another. Okay. So here you go, Joe, this was exactly what you asked about, which was, yeah. Do you think that would have slipped past my ear listening to the Ken Burns documentary on Ernest Hemingway in the last few weeks? Um, exactly. As you caught early on, they talked about, um, and let's see, was it the sun also rises? Uh, I think the book around that they put it, presented an excerpt in there and they pointed out how Hemingway used the word and stylistically, um, a lot. Well, I already knew that because if you were to take a look at book number four, where I went crazy as narrative nerd man, um, in the chapter on entertainment, here's something titled books. And here's a whole big chat, a uh, big table where I sat down and calculated both the butt to end ratio, the narrative index and the and frequency for, I think about 40 books. And they're all in here, all these famous books. And lo and behold, when you look at the and frequency, for those of you who've done the course, you know what this is, but for everybody, all we're talking about is the percentage of words in a text that are the word and. Um, turns out there is an ideal value for uh, well, for brains that have good deep narrative intuition, for editors, they converge on a frequency of two and a half percent of all the words in a text are the word and. And if you don't believe it, go check it yourself as we've done a number of times look at really well edited stuff from the New Yorker, from the Atlantic, from the New York Times, and you will see it converges on two and a half percent. And most of the values are under 3%. They hover right around two and a half, you know, 2.4, 2.8, whatever. Very few get much over three, um, 3% or um, yeah, 3%. And then as I was doing all these different famous novels, you know, I mean, I've got um, oh, just a whole bunch of famous authors. Uh, to Kill a Mockingbird, Catcher in the Rye, 1984, Lord of the Rings, uh, yada, yada, yada. Um, almost all of them are in the upper twos, 2.5 to 3.0. Few of them wander into the low threes. And then all of a sudden, much to my shock, um, uh, The Old Man in the Sea is 4.6. Just way the hell up there. There it is. Uh, a narrative index, but Dan ratio, 19 but the and frequency is 4.6. And there's no other book anywhere close to that. And then uh, Death in the Afternoon is 3.4. And where else? Um, there's several others. They're all way up there. For, for Whom the Bell Tolls is 3.5%. So exactly what they told about in there, he used and as a stylistic feature. And then they gave some examples in there. Um, not sure what that means. It just means that, that there's a little bit of noise in that um, and frequency of there's an artistic dimension to and. But the bigger context for the word and is that it's characteristic of really uh, boring, unreadable government texts and reports and things like that. And there's a whole case study I tell about in the course about the World Bank reports that were analyzed and and those just went crazy. They they end up with the and frequency reaching over four, over five, all the way up to six, even seven percent meaning that 7% of all the words in the report are the word and. And why? Because and is a word of agreement that you can glue all this context, content together with. And it's, you know, just non-narrative. Um, here's a couple other introductory things that I meant to say at the beginning of the hour. We got about five minutes left before we we'll wrap it up here. Um, Stephen Jay Gould was a great evolutionist when I was in graduate school. I worshipped him. I got to spend a little bit of time around him in his lunchtime discussion group. And I hosted him twice for lunch. And um at Winthrop House. And the first time walking down there on the way down, 
he was talking to me about his monthly column in Natural History Magazine. And he said when they did the deal with him, which was five or six years earlier at that point, uh, he said, I had a list of 50 uh, topics that I wanted to write columns about. And he said, if I ever ran out of topics each month, I would delve into that list. And he said, it's now five, six years later, I still never even looked at those 50 topics. Uh, every month, something comes up that he had things to say about. So I feel the same way. I have a list of 25 things I was going to go through here. Um, here's where the course is, by the way, for Jen and you. And they were part of, I should have produced this at the beginning. They were part of rounds one and two. And um, they, you know, those were the two open rounds. Then we got into the Fish and Wildlife National Park Service and uh, Aura was astronomers, coral reefs, um, CSU Biomed, fisheries, NSF museum folks. Um, next month, in two weeks, we're starting with uh, FAA, Federal Aviation uh, Administration, and lots of other groups circling around. So it's really great. It really is working and, and spreading like that. The narrative redux, that's going to be, we're going to rerun last week's event identical. Um, and uh, the only thing different will be a new Q&A. We'll have all the same people back, but they'll be live. And we'll show it. The structure of the event was five half-hour sessions, each one um, 18 minutes of the presentations, five back-to-back -back presentations. Then we bring them on for Q&A for only like 10 minutes, but um, the, there's just so much content to it. And it's really fun. We had, we had a ball last week. And the amazing thing about that event was that it hit a maximum uh, number of people of 768 that I saw at the near the beginning. Um, two hours later at the end of it, we still had 610 people. That's 80% retention. Everybody hung in there and, um, you know, lots of uh, just all raves for... Um, for the emails that people sent. And I was gonna talk a little bit about Earth Day that is um, coming up and uh, starts, is it tomorrow, I guess. Uh, Nancy Knowlton in the course talks about her Earth Optimism Summit that I helped her craft in 2017. And to do the fundraising for that, we put together a video that was just basically said the ABT of the Earth Movement of, of Earth Day basically. And what the ABT was that we used for that little video said um, Earth Day was created in 1970, I believe, and over the decades has done a lot of great things and helped a lot to crystallize the entire environmental movement in the United States in particular. Uh, but over the years, it's had a tendency to get a little too caught up in all the bad news, uh, which can eventually drag people down and drain motivation energy. Therefore, it's time for a little bit of a new voice. And that was her event, the Earth Optimism Summit, that she ran in the spring of 2017 and it was so successful. They ran it again last year, I think, and are continuing it. So um, that all kind of had arose out of a very clear ABT. They knew exactly what they were about. Um, here's the last thing that I will mention for today because this could be easily another hour, which is this documentary, Seaspiracy on Netflix. And yikes, um, lots and lots of, a whole bunch of different people in ocean conservation contacted me. They've all been up in arms over this documentary. The ABT of the of the film really, I think, in essence, is um, for 20 some years, these major groups have been trying to save the oceans. Um, and they've had the best of intentions. But some of them have used it as a cause to raise lots of money for themselves while not really attending to the tougher problems. Therefore, here's an expose that, you know, indicts them. Um, it's really unfortunate, some aspects of it. There's a lot of, they, they, a lot of flaws with it. Some of the science in it isn't so good. A lot of people really are hurt by it. Um, I'm not going to say anything more about it for now because I'm in the thick of talking with some of these groups on what to do in response to it, um, except to say that, I hate to break the news to you, but the impact of Netflix is pretty trivial these days. And this stuff, there's just a tidal wave of content coming out now. All my film school friends, not all, but, but tons of them are working on these films now. And they tell me on a daily basis, like we can't believe the number of films where they're just feeding this beast of content, 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 content. And so something like this comes out. And for those of you who've read the books or had the course, you know about the inner and outer circle. And this thing really upset the inner circle of the ocean conservation world. But the question is, is it really reaching the outer circle? You know, I, I, I question that. Um, and that's something that we can talk about next week because that's the end of an hour. 
Uh, that blew by. Sorry if I got talking really fast there for a while, but it's just so fun to talk with old Australian friends and they were such a great part of the course. Uh, and Park Howell didn't make it to join us, but I'm sure he will. Lots of people are going to join this podcast uh, in future upcoming episodes. And it's just going to be fun for me because it's kind of a, a release to just have free form and not in, within the course with guests. We always have an agenda we got to be doing. But here there is no agenda other than the ABT agenda. So thanks, everybody, for joining us for this hour. Uh, the two of them were wonderful. Thanks, Jen and Ewan. That was great. We'll have you back again sometime soon. And on that note, I think that I will stop sharing and check out. Thanks, Matt.